let's travel back in time to the golden age of the minicomputer. Minicomputers were much smaller than their predecessors and they made computing affordable for medium-sized businesses. This is the computer and these are disk drives. If we take a closer look at these computers, we see that they invariably have front panels. To understand what a front panel does, we first have to establish how a computer works. And bear with me for a minute if you already know this part. Inside the computer is a central processing unit, CPU, essentially a calculator that can follow instructions. And it gets these instructions from memory. And here I lump together several different kinds of memory into a single box. The CPU will fetch one instruction at a time and then execute it. And that may involve reading some data from memory, performing some primitive operation like adding two numbers, writing data to memory, and communicating with the outside world. This is called input and output. Note in particular that everything starts with an instruction fetch. There needs to be instructions, in other words software, in memory to begin with, otherwise the CPU doesn't know what to do. Software is notoriously difficult to get right. This early computer bug was an actual insect stuck in a relay. But nowadays, of course, when we say bug, we usually refer to a mistake or logical flaw in software that causes the computer to behave in unexpected ways. And when that happens, it helps tremendously if we have some way of stepping through the program one instruction at a time and observe very closely what's going on. The front panel allows you to do exactly that. It lets you stop the ongoing computation at any point and inspect and modify the state of the CPU and memory. It is a direct precursor to present-day debuggers. On modern computer systems we run many programs at the same time, so one program can be used to stop and inspect another. But mini computers were designed to run one program at a time on the bare metal, so it makes sense to have a hardware debugger. But the front panel also has another use. Recall that a computer needs instructions, otherwise it doesn't know what to do. So when you buy a standalone computer today, you always get both hardware and software. A PC motherboard, for instance, has software inside one of the chips, otherwise when you turn on the power nothing would happen. But this wasn't always the case. The main selling point for mini computers was that they were affordable. So manufacturers did everything to keep costs down, and many models did not include software. You'd power on the computer, and its memory would be entirely blank. And the only reason the manufacturers could get away with this was, you guessed it, the front panel. That was already there as a debugging tool that allows you to inspect and modify memory, and therefore could be used to manually toggle in the software, one instruction at a time. This wasn't limited to mini computers, by the way. The first home computer, the Altair from 1974, also had a front panel, and for the same two reasons, to reduce cost and to assist in debugging. Now, the typical mini computer user would not enter a large computer program at the front panel. The actual application software that you wanted to run would be stored on punched cards, paper tape, magnetic tape, or even magnetic disks and you'd have some equipment that could read data off that medium and provide it as input to the CPU. But everything still had to start with an instruction fetch from memory. So you still had to put a little bit of code into memory manually just to get the ball rolling. This procedure came to be known as bootstrapping from the old expression pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. That's why we still talk about rebooting a computer. So at the start of a new workday, you'd power up the Mini and manually toggle in the Bootstrap program, which would then load a bigger program from, let's say, paper tape. Bootstrap programs were often highly optimized for size. One interesting technique was to have an infinite loop ending with a jump instruction, and this code would fetch data words from the tape reader and store them backwards in memory. And at some point you'd overwrite the jump instruction, so the CPU would automatically proceed into the newly loaded code. I didn't experience the age of mini computers myself, so I don't have a personal connection to these machines. But I think there's something remarkable and beautiful going on here, and it's this. Computer hardware without software is inert, it doesn't do anything. And software without hardware is just information, it doesn't do anything either, except possibly wanting to be free. 
But when you put the two of them together, something magical happens and the whole thing springs to life in this complex self-sustaining activity that we call computation. Now, I don't mean to say that computation is life necessarily, but there are some profound similarities, including this interdependence of hardware and software, and the chicken and egg problem of how it all starts. And when you program a computer from a front panel, you get to be there when it happens. You get to physically provide that initial spark. Of course, this is not a practical way to start your computer every day and many mini-computer owners would eventually upgrade their system with a boot ROM to automate the process. People still occasionally front-panel boot mini-computers recreationally, or even ceremonially. But as for me, I have other computers close to my heart, and I always wanted to know what it would be like to bring one of them to life by toggling in initial instructions. So I was very much delighted to realize in a flash of insight that one of the computers that I do have a personal connection to actually can be front panel programmed. It just wasn't designed for that purpose. And as you've already figured out from the video title, that computer is the AVR 80 Mega 88 microcontroller that I've used as a demo platform and in countless other electronic projects. See, when you buy one of these microcontrollers, you are buying computer hardware without software. Some microcontroller models have boot drums inside, but this one doesn't. Instead, there is an electrical interface that lets you stop the CPU and inspect and modify memory. Does that sound familiar? Now, just because something has an electrical interface, it doesn't necessarily follow that you can operate it using mechanical switches. All microcontrollers have programming interfaces, but most of those are essentially serial ports with clock lines and data lines, and some of them require precise timing or complicated checksums, and just about all of them would choke on contact bounds. When you throw a mechanical switch, the signal doesn't make a clean transition from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. It tends to bounce around for a while before settling, and that would interfere with nearly any electronic communication protocol. The AT Mega 88 provides two programming interfaces. The one you typically use, because it needs the least amount of wiring, is indeed a serial protocol, and it suffers from those very issues. But there's also a parallel programming interface that miraculously has all the right properties. It's completely asynchronous, there's no clock line or timing requirements. There are several independent signals that do one specific thing each. And finally, everything is done with latches, which makes it safe to repeat an operation several times in a row and that solves the problem of contact bounds. So, without further ado, here's my front panel for the AT Mega 88. There's no backside, so you can see the microcontroller, a bunch of resistors and wires to LEDs and mechanical switches. For more information about the wiring, there's a link in the video description. All of this is hardware, there's no software in sight. And therefore, when we apply power, nothing much happens. At the end of this video, we're going to have a small program up and running on this machine, and the program is going to blink with these four LEDs, like a 4-bit binary counter. That may not be the most impressive computer program you could imagine, but the point here isn't the destination, it's the journey. Before we embark on that journey, I'll say a few words about how I made the panel. As you can see, this is acrylic, and behind the acrylic is a piece of paper. I made the design in Inkscape on a millimeter grid, making sure to use the correct drill hole diameter for each component. Then I printed it and cut out the holes. I used a hole punch for the small ones and a pair of rounded nail scissors for the bigger ones. I used FreeCAD to model the acrylic sheet and for this project I just manually carried over the measurements from Inkscape to constraints in the CAD model. And then I sent my design to a company that cuts acrylic sheets from custom drawings that you upload, which was surprisingly affordable. Then I made a simple wooden frame with hot glue and pre-drilled the mounting holes. And then I just put everything together. This is an easy way to make slick front panels for electronic projects. And you can do it too. Now then, this is the power switch, 5 volts to drive the chip. 
This switch will put 12 volts on the reset line, which is the signal to the microcontroller to stop the CPU and enter programming mode. And once we're in programming mode, we use these controls to place instructions in memory. And then we leave programming mode to execute the instructions. So let's develop some software. This will be a tiny program, only seven instructions, but that's enough for blinking some LEDs. The following is going to be highly specific to the 80 mega 88 chip. Don't worry if you get lost in the details here, you can follow along on a high level and still enjoy the ride. So again, the output of our program is sent to four LEDs. And because most pins of the microcontroller are used for the parallel programming interface, the only place I could find four consecutive free pins was in the middle of port C. So the first thing we're going to do is configure those four pins as outputs. And to do that, we'll first load an immediate value, a constant, into one of the CPU registers. Let's use register 16. And we're going to load the value 00111100 in binary. The middle four bits are one, and they correspond to the four pins connected to the LEDs. Then we transfer register 16 to output port number 7, also known as data direction register C. Now we're going to reuse register 16 as our binary counter. So we're also going to send it to output port 8, that controls the actual voltages on the pins of port C. Or at least those pins that are configured as outputs. So this will make the four LEDs light up. Next we're going to implement a delay loop, and here we're going to use a special instruction that works with a pair of registers as a single 16-bit counter. And we're going to add 8 to this counter, add immediate word to register pair R24 and R25, and we add 8. And then we're going to do that in a loop until the addition overflows. So branch if carry is clear, if there wasn't a carryover from the addition, to address 3. This delay loop is going to take about 30 milliseconds. And then we increment our counter, which is register 16, and jump all the way back to instruction 2, relative jump to address 2. And there we have our complete blink and lights program. Now we have to translate this program into binary machine code. And for such a small program, you could look up the instructions by hand in the AVR instruction set reference, or you could use an assembler and look at the binary output file. As you can see, every instruction has turned into a 16-bit number, shown here in hexadecimal. These are the high bytes and these are the low bytes. So this is the software that we are going to load into the memory of the microcontroller using the front panel. And for that we need to have the chip in programming mode, so let's halt the CPU. The ready light comes on to indicate that the device is ready to accept a new command. The way the parallel programming interface works, and hence the way this front panel works, is that you give commands, sometimes with parameters, that are stored in five internal registers called command, address high, address low, data high and data low. You use the rotary switch to select one of the five registers. You put eight bits of data on the switches. And then you press load to transfer the data from the switches into the selected register. And once you're happy with all five registers, you press execute to actually trigger the command. The command register uses something called one-hot encoding, which means that each possible command is represented by an individual bit. And for convenience, I've printed those commands underneath the corresponding switch. The first thing we have to do is to erase the memory of the microcontroller. Now, as I've said, the memory is already erased when you get the chip from the factory, but it doesn't hurt to be thorough. So we're gonna set the bit for erase chip and load that value into the command register. And the erase chip command doesn't take any parameters, so we can leave the other four registers any way we like. And that means we're ready to execute this command. And when I press execute, the ready light will turn off briefly while the chip is being erased, and then it turns back on, and this only takes a few milliseconds, which is too fast to capture on video, unfortunately, but it's visible to the eye. And now the memory is a blank slate. Next, we're going to enter the program. And the AT Mega 88 fetches instructions from flash memory, so our command is going to be write flash, and we put that in the command register. Now it gets a little bit complicated, because the AT Mega 88 can only write to flash in chunks of 64 bytes at a time, so called pages. So we're going to deposit one instruction at a time into a temporary page buffer, and that's what the deposit button is for. And once we're happy with the entire page, we press execute to transfer it to flash. 
We'll start at address 0. So we set both the upper and lower address byte to 0. And then we enter the first instruction, which is E3 in the high byte, load, and OC in the low byte, load. And now we can deposit this into the page buffer. We go to address 1, and here we only need to change the low byte of the address. And here the instruction is B9, 07, and deposit. Address 2. Here we only need to change the low byte of the instruction to 08 and deposit. Address 3. And here we only need to change the high byte to 96. Deposit. Address 4 should be F7 F0. Address 5 is 95 03 and finally address 6 is CF FB. The entire program is now in the page buffer and we can execute the write flash command to make it stick. And that's it. If we now turn the CPU back on, it will happily run our little program and we can finally see the blinking lights. And that's how you program an AVR microcontroller from a front panel. This video was made possible by my esteemed community of supporters on Patreon and Steady. If you'd like to join them, there's a link in the video description. And there you'll also find credits for all the gorgeous photographs of mini computers and other Creative Commons material that I used for this presentation. That's all I had for today. I hope you learned something. Take care and thanks for watching. Bye.